spring games just mean we're moving closer to the college football being back again. Don't let anybody take away happiness if you enjoy spring ball. There, I was catching up on spring ball games today and just, just some great football that was being played, and it gives us an insight to the team. You can't put full stock into it. You can't overreact, but we're here to talk about some spring games and talk about certain things that gives us a little insight into what we might be seeing into the season. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to the YouTube channel at the Coach Steve Show. Follow Ray on Apple and iTunes. Leave a five-star review. Follow at Coach underscore Steve72 on Twitter and the Coach Steve Show on Twitter as well. Um, go do all that. Leave a comment in the comment section down below. All that good stuff. Um, but really, subscribe and, and like the videos. That really helps trying to grow this, 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 this show tremendously. So let's get into it. Had a lot of spring football games. And the biggest one I think everybody was looking forward to was the Colorado Buffs spring game. Your new head coach and prime, Deion Sanders there. Uh, he has brought in a ton of excitement. He's brought in a ton of just – I don't even know if swagger is the appropriate word for this because he – I don't know if that would be disrespectful to anything, but it seems like he's brought a lot of swagger to this Colorado team. And the, the spring game, there was over 40,000 people there. It looked like it was completely sold out. There was snow. It was this beautiful scenery. They're excited. He's out there dancing, having a good time. He's in his cowboy hat like he was um, at Jackson State and just looking like a, having a grand old time. And everybody was loose. Everybody was having fun. He did interview on the side. And, you know, was having a grand old time. But the question for this Colorado team coming in was, how many recruits necessarily were they going to bring in? Because he said right when he got there, hey, a lot of you are going to be looking for a new home. A lot of you are going to have to figure out where you're going to go because we're bringing in so-and-so. I am going to go out and get the best players here. You guys did not perform the way that you needed to. So we're going to get new guys. And they brought in a ton of transfers, some from his previous teams, from his previous team. But regardless, a lot of transfers came in. He had Coach Sean Lewis come in. He was a head coach at Kent State for a few, uh, for about four years, offensive coordinator at Syracuse, um, at Bowling Green as well. He was a tight ends coach at Eastern Illinois University. He played at Wisconsin. He is from the suburb area of Illinois and Chicago. And to leave his head coaching job, to go be an offensive coordinator at Colorado with Deion Sanders is huge. And he brought his offensive line coach, Coach O'Boyle, as well, who I've almost had on this podcast, which we'll, hopefully we'll get him on um, eventually as the summer moves on. To bring those guys in, the curious thing was, with their schedule, how are they going to look in the spring game? How was his son, um, Shadur Sanders, coming in? How is he going to look? Um, uh, you know, are they going to be not competent is the right word, but with the type of, what kind of offense were they going to bring? Was it going to bring in the Deion Sanders offense that he saw at Jackson state, or was he going to allow coach Sean Lewis to just kind of do his thing? The the up temp, what you guys saw at Baylor, that's what he was going to do. Coach Sean Lewis learned it under coach Babers at Eastern Illinois university. I was even there and helped out spring ball and got to see how that unfolded. Then he went on to Bowling Green. They did the same thing. Syracuse, and he was doing the same thing at Kent State. Now, is it 100% the same as Baylor? No, there's some tweaks. There's some different things. Uh, not all RPOs. Uh, once in a while, they're going to go full up tempo, but they're not going to. Sometimes they have to stop and do a check with me. So the, the question coming into this was what kind of energy was going to be brought? Well, the energy factor, check. You've got the check mark for the energy level. What was the team going to look like defensively and offensively? From a defensive perspective, because the offense is really easy to talk about, but the defensive perspective, when they had the microphone on on Coach uh, on Prime, on Coach Prime, he was yelling, hit the ball, hit them, hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. And one thing you saw was they all flowed to the football. Colorado was not a good team last year. They were far from anything being relevant. They were far from anything being talked about. No offense to anybody. They just did not play well. And so they they flew to the football. You know, the, you, you saw the number two defense versus number one offense, and you saw number one defense versus number two – number one defense versus number two offense. They flew to the football, and you saw corners and safeties play a lot better. That's That 
says a lot to Coach Coach Prime. They they flew to the football. Now they still have some things they need to work on. They had some breakdowns in coverage. They gave up some big runs from a defensive line perspective and getting pressure. Um, and it's a, and they had to go against their own offense, which is a you know high flying, fast tempo offense. So the defense to me looked like they just flew to the football a lot better. They looked like they were hitting a lot better. They were more physical than they were last year. The offense was exactly what you expected to be. If you just go pop in some Kent State film or just go to YouTube and find Kent State, if you go to YouTube and you type in Syracuse football with Coach Babers, if you go in and type in Baylor offense, you're going to see a lot of similarities, especially the Syracuse stuff, because that's where Coach Lewis was really – he was offense coordinator, co-offensive coordinator there, and that, that type of offense is what you're really – going to see and that's what you saw in the spring game they they as soon as that ball is dead if it's a complete pass the running back gets tackled whatever it is they are on the ball and they're snapping the ball within eight to 12 seconds and the spring time with eastern illinois coach babers had a stopwatch and they had to snap the ball that fast and i remember i think it was 15 seconds they were getting the ball off and he was irate it was not something that he was happy with it was not something that he said that's not what they're about so if you go look at those type of offenses that's exactly what you're going to see um coach coach um sanders son looked pretty good he is a very mobile quarterback and the way he was throwing the football he looked confident he looked like he was understanding the offense because it's not an entirely complex offense you can't have this huge complex offense if you're going to go up and and you know snap the ball Every 10 seconds, you, you just can't, you know, the, the signals come in quick. You have to re- understand it. You may only get maybe two reads, anything like that. You're not going to get this complex play. Um, it might literally just be an RPO handing the ball off. It might be a play action type of thing. Um, the running back I thought looked extremely well. Uh, Smoke, he's a transfer, one of the many, many transfers that they have on offense alone. Offense alone. They have – a quarterback transfer, running back transfer, tight end transfer, right tackle transfer, right guard transfer, left guard transfer, and another wide receiver transfer. And according to their depth chart and who was in the spring game, that is who was starting. That seven transfers starting compared to last year. The number two, quote-unquote, because you know the depth chart, this is where we don't want to overreact. They have three as their number twos, quote-unquote, transfer. Then they have two more as their third type of string transfer. On defense. They have a defensive end that's a transfer, defensive tackle, one of their backers that's a transfer, another backer that's a transfer, their middle linebacker that's a transfer, another backer transfer, free safety transfer, cornerback transfer, and their nickelback. Nine transfers starting. Two as their number twos and one as number three. Special teams, they have all but one. All but one. All these guys are transfers that he has brought in. Their backups are guys that were already there. A lot of sophomores, a lot of juniors, some that transferred last year, but they are transfers that he had brought in. And watching that offense with the offensive line trying to learn it, with how the receivers were going, with the quarterback play, it looked fun. It looked explosive. They looked fast. Now, the question is going to be, are they going to be fast as the year goes on? They have a very tough schedule coming up. You know, the things we're taking away from the spring ball is one of the questions we had was can coach Deion Sanders coach football? He was at Jackson State. There, there's a documentary on him on Amazon. On Amazon, you guys can go watch. There's a bar stool one out there that we can watch. And the question is what kind of coach is he? Is he next as a nose coach? You know, what kind of coach is he? And he seems to me like a coach that is a culture building guy. You watch that documentary. On Amazon, he gets on them about cell phones. He gets on them about how they're dressed. He gets on them how they act. You've seen videos. He brought up women that work for them and say, we treat women with the utmost respect. If you disrespect these women today and or during the spring game, he is mic'd up. Go on ESPN. He is mic'd up. And he said, hey, when you come back out here, you put two sleeves on. We don't do it in practice. Why are you doing it in this game? So if if he's more, I, I, he guarantee he knows way more defense than we all do. What kind of coach is he? What kind of team are we going to see? Well, I saw a team that was very motivated in the spring game. Now, you don't want to overreact. 
of course. But it's nice to see a glimpse of what we're about to find out about this team. So it's very curious after seeing the spring game, how are they going to compare to their schedule? How are they going to um, handle their schedule? They have an extremely, extremely tough schedule coming up for them. Extremely tough schedule. Um, having technical difficulties. Here we go. So let's look at Colorado's schedule. How are they going to match up? They have an incredibly tough schedule. Well, they have to go to Texas and open up against um, TCU, who lost in the national championship versus Georgia. And then, you know, Nebraska, who had their spring game the same day. Uh, Colorado State, who they should be able to be. But then you have Oregon, USC, Arizona State, Stanford, UCLA, Oregon State, Arizona, Washington State, and Utah. Like your toughest, your your non-conference game is Nebraska and TCU. Now Nebraska's not being the same. Nebraska, TCU, you know they're doing they're they're turning a turning a corner there. So can this offense hold up? Can the players hold up? Is the culture and the way they're going to be motivated to play going to hold them up in the schedule that they're about to embark on? Now not every team's going to be the toughest of the tough. But, you know, Oregon's always tough. USC coming in with Caleb Williams. Arizona State's going to have a new coach. So, you know, there's a possibility there. Stanford, new coach. We know what UCLA and Chip Kelly's about. Oregon State surprised everybody last year, and they're, they're starting to turn a corner. Arizona beat some teams last year. Washington State has been consistent since Mike Leach was there, and even when he left. And then Utah's won the Pac-12 for two years in a row. So I think they can make some noise after seeing their spring game and how they can combat with – their offense and their defense and how coach prime is going to coach them and kind of what we're seeing from that spring game. But you'd never want to overreact to the spring game, of course, but it is cool to see how they're, how the offense looked, you know, was it going to be more of what coach prime wants? Is it, was it going to be more of um, what coach Sean Lewis was going to do, but you know, it's, it's really cool to see, uh, that it was going to be Sean Lewis is offense that we were able to see. And um, so I, it's just going to be curious to see how Colorado is going to combat with their schedule and with their team and the type of offense they're going to be running. Another team that had their spring game, which was not as impressive as Colorado's was the Texas A&M Aggies who did not do well last year. Of course um, they underperformed. To, to to what a lot of people thought because they were the number one recruiting class. They still have a high recruiting class coming in this year. They do not have as many transfers starting at all compared to Colorado. Um, they, they they did bad last year. They know they ended up being five and seven overall, two and six in conference. They lost a lot of close games. They played a lot of teams tough. Um, I do believe they beat LSU last year. So with Texas A&M, the big question mark was going to be, you got to see they have a new offensive coordinator, Bobby Petrino, who you know used to be at Arkansas. He, you know, has been at different places. He was hired as offensive coordinator, which means you know now he is going to be calling the shots there. And one of the things is, what kind of offense are we going to see? Well, we kind of saw what we're going to bring to the table because he he's very good at passing plays. He's very good at mixing it up um, with Bobby Petrino there. But the question is going to be, how long is this going to last? You know, in the spring, it, it is what it is. You know, Jimbo Fisher gave out two awards for the spring ball, which I don't understand that. Apparently teams do that. If they give out awards, cool. I don't understand awards for spring football. You know, I'm not about giving everybody a trophy. I, I think things need to be earned. And it's, again, we're not overreacting. It's spring ball. But there's just that type of thing where you get a little confused there. With Texas A&M, you know, I don't know which fans are worth. You always hear about Michigan talking about how they're going to win national championship and national championship. Texas A&M might be worse. They might be way worse than anything like that. At least Michigan has made the playoffs the last two years. And, you know, they, they haven't won the first round, but at least they're getting there. They've beat Ohio State the last two years. Texas A&M had this thing where they beat Alabama last year, and that's kind of saved Jimbo Fisher's job, apparently. But all the money they're paying him, they have not lived up to that type of money performance. Then you're about to have Texas and Oklahoma come into the SEC. 
right? It's not going to get any easier. You're going to have your ni- nice little rival there with Texas coming into the SEC. With Texas a and schedule, it's going to be curious how long Bobby Petrino is the offensive coordinator because Jimbo Fisher, you know, they, they, he needs to have all the papers. Like, just two papers isn't enough. He has to have this entire folder of offensive play calls where Bobby Petrino, Bobby Petrino doesn't, doesn't do that. With the offense we saw, it was hard to tell. Was it Jimbo Fisher's offense? Was it Bobby Petrino's offense? Because they run similar styles. But Jimbo Fisher, he's he's living off of that national championship he won with Florida State. He is living off the coattails of that and the coattails of being around Nick Saban. Not saying he's a bad coach. Offensive guy. Offensive genius. That's what he's known. That's why he was brought to Florida State, and that's why he is brought to Texas A&M. That, that is why he is here. That's why he's there but they have not lived up to consistency of doing that. He's living off the coattails of this national championship that he won with Florida State. He's living off of being this offensive guy after being around Nick Saban, and he's living off of beating Alabama last year. That's what they're living off of right now with him. And he, I think he heard everything about how he needs to be the CEO. He needs to, be, to not be the play caller, which is good, in, you know, not every head coach needs to be that. For example, the late Mike Leach, he was the offensive play caller, but he was the CEO. But he really let the defense do their thing, and his offense was so simple that he was going to call the plays. Did he win national championships? No, but they won a lot of games, and wherever he went as the head coach, they were turning the programs around. But he wasn't making Jimbo Fisher money. He wasn't doing that. And so with Jimbo Fisher, it, can his ego allow him – to just sit back and be a CEO. It reminds me of Auburn with Gus Manzon, who was a brilliant offensive coach as well. But he tried this before too, where he's tried to hand it off. I believe it was two times, two or three times, he tried to hand off the play calling duties. And then three, fourth, fifth game into the season, all of a sudden, he brought it back. He had in Morris, Coach Morris, come in in his last year to be the offensive coordinator. And you could tell when plays were being called by who. When Morris was out there, you saw about three wide receivers, four wide receivers wide. When Gus was calling it, you saw two or three wide receivers, but one of those was a wing. You knew who was calling plays. So the question is going to be, the question will be, how long, if things go bad, if things go bad for this Texas A&M offense or this team, if they're not winning, how long until Jimbo Fisher says, hey, Bobby Petrano, you just, you just deal with quarterbacks and I'll deal with – um, everything else. I'll deal with it all after that. Because with their schedule, they open up pretty well. New Mexico, they should beat. But Miami, who's emerged, are they going to be able to beat Miami? You and Moreau, they should be. And then you start getting to your SEC play. At, does Jimbo Fisher around Al- – does Alabama is the one where is Jimbo Fisher say, hey, I'm taking over? If things don't go, if they lose to Miami, if they lose to Arkansas, Auburn, does he? And then he wants to beat Alabama very badly. Does he sit there and say, "I take over"? It's a strong possibility. But what we saw in the spring game, they have good players, they have athletic players, they recruited well. But looking at this schedule and how the there's there's games on there they could win: New Mexico, UNL Monroe, and Albany Christian. But with the emergence of all these other teams. South Carolina, Tennessee, LSU. We don't know what Mississippi State's going to look like now. Does Arkansas turn the corner? What's Auburn going to look like with Hugh Freeze and that type of offensive mind that he's going to bring in? It's possible we see a five to seven to seven and five win Texas A&M, eight and eight and four Texas, you know, win team again. So I'm very curious. We didn't see a lot from the spring game. And it was hard to tell who was calling offense. Was it all Bobby Petrino's? But after the spring and the stories we start hearing, are we going to start hearing things of rumblings? Are they not going to get along? It's going to be very um, curious time to see with how this is going to go and if Jimbo Fisher is going to continue to allow um, – Bobby Petrino to be the offensive coordinator and how long can his ego stand there? So he, you know, to be the CEO, can his ego stand that stand it in order for him to keep that going to wrap up the show? We had another spring game to talk about because 
Uh, some people have had a lot to say about this team after watching the spring ball. Um, they think it's one of the worst teams of this program they have seen. And again, is it overreacting to spring ball or is there some truth to this? Or were we all just watching a different game? Or is it because I am a fan of them? Because their stuff is right behind me if you're watching the video. Alabama had their spring game as well. Now, there were some technical difficulties, so you have to go back and rewatch some of it. They come in with a couple new coordinators. Tommy Reese came over from Notre Dame to be the offensive coordinator for the Alabama Crimson Tide, which to me was a higher shock because Tommy Reese played at Notre Dame, loves Notre Dame, so it was kind of a weird hire or for him to leave to go to Alabama. But he's coming in as the play caller for Alabama for their offense. And they also have a new defensive coordinator, Kevin Steele, is coming back, which was another shocking hire. He used to be with Alabama. He was at Auburn. There was shady stuff going on at Auburn with him and Coach Gus Malzahn. But Coach Saban, you have to trust him. He knows something we don't. Um, so we got two coordinators. So we had to watch the defense and we had to watch the offense with your two new coordinators and how hands-off – Nick Saban is during the spring game. He wears a suit and he just stands behind and watches. A um, couple notes that I took before we start talking about what everybody else said. You, you had to watch this quarterback battle that is going on at Alabama. At Alabama, you have a quarterback battle because Bryce Young is no longer there. Um, your first stringer was Jalen Monroe. He got some playing time last year when Bryce Young was hurt. And so all eyes were going to be on him. But the quarterback battle right hot on his tail um, was Ty Simpson. Ty Simpson is a uh, redshirt freshman who was there as well. He is right on his tail with the quarterback battle going on with Monroe. Now, Monroe has a couple playing more playing experiences and games compared to that. Some other positions you're looking at is the wide receivers group. You're looking at the linebackers group, and you're watching the offensive line because one of the weaknesses – for this Alabama team last year was their offensive line. Apparently, even though a lot of, a lot of teams in the country would have taken Alabama's offensive line compared to maybe the play that they had for their teams. And, and so I was curious watching this game. Now you don't need to watch the whole game to get a feel for what, what, what happens with this Alabama team. One thing I was going to look at was the play calling from Tommy Reese. Because when you watched at Alabama, they were very tight end heavy. They would recruit a ton of tight ends. They would be under center. They would be in shotgun. Uh, they did a lot of wide zone. They would do a lot of dive plays. And they would do a lot of mesh plays and short route plays that would eventually open up a deep route play. But a lot of those type of things, especially heavy, relied on the run game with all their tight ends. Now at Alabama, they used to be like that. Used to have a ton of tight ends. But they don't necessarily use the same type of tight end play that Notre Dame did with Tommy Reese. And if you watch any documentary or anything with Nick Say when he talks about coordinators, he says they have a system. When he hired Bill O'Brien to be his offensive coordinator, he said, yes, Bill O'Brien's going to come in. He has a way about an offense that he wants to run, how he wants to call it, and certain things. But he's going to do the things that we do because we have a system put in place. He can have certain tweaks. He's going to have good ideas that we're going to do. Because he's, you know, he's a great offensive mind. He called it a Penn State. He's been in the NFL. He's been with the Patriots. So obviously he brings a lot to the table. But we have a system, and he's going to do things the way we want to do. And you saw that. They were running certain things when Lane Kiffin was even there. If you look at it, they were running certain things. Now there's different things they were running. Even when Bill O'Brien was there, Steve Sarkeesian was there. So I was very curious to see what kind of offense we were going to see with Tommy Reese calling it because he's going to come in and run what Nick Saban basically – Nick Saban's not going to call the plays for him. He's going to hand, talk about their system, and, and this is the type of thing they have probably talked about in the interview and said, hey, this is what I'm running. What is your offensive mind? How would you fit into this? What would you bring into this? How are you going to adapt to the type of players we have? Because we don't recruit all the tight ends like at Notre Dame. Now we get the big offensive linemen. But we have speedy wide receivers. How can we do this? Notre Dame likes to shift. Notre Dame likes to do this. How can you bring that into the Alabama um, way here? So I was very curious to see how that play calling was. And it, it, it looked like the same Alabama team. But before we fully get on to the quarterback battle, the wide receiver group. These wide receivers, you have a, you have a couple of juniors and you have a sophomore. Even their backups are good. 
And even the announcer said it, and I thought the same thing. They were getting a lot of four wide. They were getting some wing stuff like they always have. Don't be surprised if this year Tommy Reese probably didn't do this a lot at Alabama or at Notre Dame. He, you're probably going to see a lot of five wide. And the thing with this group this year with Alabama, they always had that one wide receiver that you had to really focus on. This year with this wide receiver t- group, I don't know who you're going to stop. Burton is fast. Brooks can just line up anywhere. Isaiah Bond can line up anywhere. Their backup, Kobe Pennis, is good. Uh, Malik Benson is a transfer. He's good. Like They just have really good wide receivers. Now, are, you're not going to have a Devontae Smith. You're not going to have anything like that necessarily to blow the top off right from the beginning, especially watch them in the spring. But it puts pressure on defenses to keep them more balanced and say, who are we going to stop? And I think that will help the quarterbacks out. And I think they can get into some five wide situational things. Just seeing how fast the wide receivers were. Um, back to play calling. You saw some of the Tommy Reese play calling with tight ends, but they were more wings. They were more wings. You saw a lot of wide zone and you saw a lot of up the middle runs, but I saw a lot of mesh concepts. I saw a lot of dig routes. I saw a lot of um, quick arrow routes that you would see at Notre Dame. They love to do that with the running backs. He would love to do that from different positions from the wide receivers, and especially with wing tight ends in the mesh routes or those shallow routes and the dig routes behind them. You saw a lot of that. So I think that's what we're going to see with Tommy Reese calling the plays. He is bringing that Notre Dame type of play calling to Alabama. Now, Alabama did that stuff too. But if Tommy Reese can fit into that type of play calling and that type of system, that's exactly what they're going to do. And I was noticing that with the play calling that they were doing. And I noticed that he was doing a lot of more zone read stuff and RPO stuff than what he would do at, at Notre Dame. Notre Dame, they would do RPOs, don't get me wrong, but they were looking to intermediate passes and they would look to play action more. At Alabama, they're going to want to RPO. They've got these big linemen. They can do wide zone. They can do more of an outside zone as well where they can hook the end. And they can do quick runs up the middle because I'm telling you right now, that running back is good. McLennan was good. Williams is good. Miller's good. Like all of their running backs played well, and they're big. They're huge. And I believe, I don't want to say his name wrong, I believe the last name was Hayes, running back for Alabama, like was just this big, strong running back. And so they were doing a lot more runs up the middle, and... They look good. And now the linemen were struggling a little bit with pass protection. Um, But you're going against a very fast defense. That's the thing with this defense before we end it with the quarterback battle and their schedule this year. The, the, The defense, they haven't missed a beat either. And to me, watching this defense compared to last year, they're big. The defensive line is back to being big, but the speed if you watch the O-line versus the D-line, the D-line had the speed that was matching to the O-line at the line of scrimmage, and it made those running backs work. It made the quarterback work when it came to pass protection. And so this year, watching them in the spring game, it looks like they're going to be super fast, which is what they need in the SEC. But the SEC is going back to really running the ball up the middle. They they went to the, the spread. They're throwing the ball around, so you had to get – smaller guys, and they were fast. Alabama's got some big dudes up front. They got some big dudes. They got some big-time recruits, and they're going to be experienced up there. They got a couple sophomores, but up front, they're going to have a couple senior guys on that defensive line, and they're going to have a couple guys there at that linebacker position that are juniors that sat behind and got some playing time last year but got to see, and they're big and they're fast. And that's the thing I got from the defense and how much they flew around, how physical they were. They did give up a couple big passes, but it's a spring ball game. But they were getting hands-on. They were physical. And that's exactly what you expect from a Alabama team. The quarterback battle was interesting. Um, Monroe had a couple bad passes, but he was very successful on the mesh routes, and he was very successful on those. But one thing with Monroe that I started to see is he's an athletic quarterback. And he can run. There was one where he did a, I can't remember if it was an inside zone read or like this more of this wide zone read concept. 
And he necessarily wasn't reading the backside defensive end. He was reading more of that CD gap defender, pulled the ball and ran and scored. Like just blew people. You know, if you want to compare it to like Justin Fields for the Bears this year, it looked like that. That's what he brings to the table. He can throw the ball decently and he can run. But the thing I noticed was every time he dropped back, <clears throat> well, they're in shotgun, but every time it was a pass play, it seemed like he would start to get ready to move. Almost like happy feet. Now, there was times the pocket broke down. Um, you saw a couple things from the Notre Dame type of play call where they kept a tight end to block. They would play action to the running back. He's saying a block. So you have six or seven um, pass protecting. But with Monroe, it just seemed like it just kind of felt like he was going to take off and run. And so that that part worries me a little bit. Um, with that, now they have all summer to fix any type of happy feet. Um, you don't want him to take off and run right away. But he in the intermediate throwing game, he was fine. Uh, but one thing I was impressed with was Ty Simpson. His mechanics, he did stay in the pocket. He had a couple of times where he had to move. He was athletic. And he looked like he throws a good ball. He threw a couple of good deep balls. There's a couple of other wide receivers make the play for him. But he was getting the mesh routes put on time. His footwork was good. He was staying in the pocket. He didn't seem like he was having that type of happy feet. And so this is an interesting quarterback battle that we have brewing with Alabama. I feel like Monroe will win it out, but we still have all summer, and this is why we can't overreact to spring. But people, man, they were saying how this Alabama team looks bad. They're going to lose a couple games. They're not going to make it back to the championship. And so this is where we're overreacting to spring. But I think this quarterback battle is something we have to keep an eye on. I feel like Monroe will win it out because of how he brings a lot to the table. He's super athletic. They can do a lot of things with him. But it depends on what type of team does Nick Saban want. Is he okay with having this athletic guy that's going to miss throws here or there? Or do they want this pocket quarterback? Because the offense has adapted now. <clears throat> He's adapted this offense to be this RPO thing that he really wants. So I'll be very curious to see how that happens with this quarterback battle that they're going to be bringing into the table. Um, their schedule is nothing to bat an eyelash at either. Um, the teams there that they should beat is Chattanooga, South Florida, and Middle Tennessee. But Middle Tennessee is still pretty good. South Florida, you know, played well last year. But those are teams they should beat. But the rest of the SEC, again, just with these emergents, Texas, we'll talk about them at another time in their spring ball. Part of them look good. Other parts don't. But the rest, man, is a tough schedule too. And so it depends. Do you give Monroe the first go? And if it's not working, Simpson – and then it's your time to shine. He, sh he showed in the spring game that he can move, he can run. But they got a quarterback battle that is brewing down there in Alabama and Tuscaloosa. So it, we need to keep an eye on that the rest of the summer, and that's what the spring ball showed us, how I think how much closer this quarterback battle is going to be than most people thought. Um, but I think they look good. People tweeted that they weren't good, but we're going to find out exactly how good they are once they get there and we see them throughout the summer. Um, that wraps up another episode. Please like, and subscribe to YouTube channel, follow right on Apple and iTunes, follow at coach underscore underscore Steve 72 on Twitter and the coach Steve show on Twitter as well. Um, leave a comment in the comment section down below. Check out all the affiliates in the description below as well. Check out all the other episodes, something out there for everybody. Um, leave a five star rating, Apple and iTunes, of course. Um, thank you guys again, and we will see you guys next time.